that, we'll let folks continue to filter in, but let me go ahead and kick this off. I am uh, Lisa Brush with the Stewardship Network and really pleased to be here with you all um, on this second Wednesday of the month during the Eastern Time Zone's noon hour and the Pacific Coast uh, 9 a.m. hour. If you don't know about the Stewardship Network, we are a 501c3 nonprofit with an award-winning 20-year history. We have our um, place-based member communities that are networks made up of all of the people who care for land and water in a specific geography, and they do on the ground conservation action. And um, for those of you who are new to the Stewardship Network's monthly webcast, we do these each and every second Wednesday. So drop them in as a recurring event in your calendar and then come on, come online and find out what we're talking about and join us if you'd like. Our mission is to connect, equip and mobilize people and organizations to care for land and water in their communities. And one of our favorite ways to connect is on the second Wednesday of each and every month. Uh, with you all all across the country and North America and sometimes overseas as well. Um, and our conference is going to be February 2nd and 3rd this year. We're going virtual again one more year. And um, we announced this just a couple of weeks ago, early registrations are coming in and we're looking forward to getting through a COVID free winter and being together in person in 2024. Our mission is to equip people and organizations to care for land and water as well. And one of the great um, pillars of EQUIP is our Gloves for Good program. And we have launched this program this year and I'm gonna turn it over to some of my colleagues and team members to share a little bit about this amazing program and what we've been able to achieve. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Tam who's our Gloves for Good lead. So Sarah, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so the Gloves for Good program provides lightly used gloves to stewards that care for our environment. Um, in doing so, we're able to support their work and prevent these gloves from going to waste. Uh, you can request them online on stewardshipnetwork.org. So what we do is we take these gloves, we get them laundered, paired, packaged, and we distribute them to those in need. It's free to pick up uh, if you're able to come to our Ann Arbor office, or we can certainly ship them to you. We just ask that you cover the cost of shipping. And then Rachel will cover different ways these gloves are being put to use. And Rachel? Yeah. So we've asked folks um, when they request gloves to tell us what essentially what they're up to, the good the gloves are doing in the world, if you will. Um, and we've seen a lot of really great activities. People are using them for classes, to collect seeds, planting, gardening, picking up trash, removing invasive species, lots of good stuff. And we've been tracking the program very closely since the start. We've distributed over 9,000 pairs of gloves since the start of the program, um, which is about 700 pounds of waste that we kept out of the landfill. And those gloves are valued at about $14,000. So really helpful for helping everybody with their budget there. Um, and then thanks to our friends at Resource Recycling Systems who did a life cycle analysis for us, um, we are able to track the carbon equivalent um, for reusing the gloves compared to buying them new. Um, and we are up to 0.87 metric tons of CO2E, so we're pretty proud of that. So from here, I will hand it over to Rob Luzinski. Thank you, Rachel. So I had the absolute pleasure of joining Urban Neighborhood Initiatives um, on Friday, October 7th as they had students from Madonna University participating in their Franciscan Day of Service. So they were volunteering with local organizations and Urban Neighborhood Initiatives was one of them. So as you can see, there's a group of students there replacing one of the birdhouses. Um, so join Lisa Marie Rodriguez and other Urban Neighborhood Initiative staff to clean up a vacant lot that has been turned into a bird sanctuary. And I am telling you, I saw it at the beginning and the end of the workday and it was incredible, the transformation. So great work to the entire team. Um, and the Stewardship Network was there with gloves available for those that didn't bring their own. Um, and these gloves are important for having, uh, they're a really important part of having a safe and effective workday. So we're really happy to be able to provide those gloves to organizations that make great use of them. Uh, and we love seeing the impact that our gloves can make out in the world. So we encourage anyone that participates in the Gloves for Good program to share your stories and photos with us. And we would love to share them with our network. And you can and see Bob Lisa Jason, even- he, they used a bunch of gloves for good recently to remove 150 pounds of trash from a park in Ypsilanti. Excellent. And you see Lisa's there 
getting to work as well, not just watching. Lisa's there making it happen, of course. Uh, so you, know, you can email gloves at stewardshipnetwork.org if you have any inquiries or, as we said, visiting the website. And we really appreciate you all for supporting this important initiative. The response has been remarkable, and we're so proud to be able to meet the need and had to end it with Lisa, one of the most stylish people I know. Uh, shout out to Lisa and the rest of the Urban Neighborhood Initiatives team for being an early Glove for Good partner and for making such a positive impact in their community. And with that, I would love to introduce the, our guest for today. So the topic is Urban Stewardship, Liberating Vacant Land in Southwest Detroit with the neighbor, Urban Neighborhood Initiatives team. So of course, we have Lisa Marie Rodriguez. We also have Mariah Bosquez, and we have Danielle Dillard. And I believe Mariah is the first one to present the group. So I'd like to welcome Mariah to come on up. And then Lisa Marie Rodriguez, if you could share the slides, that'd be lovely. Yeah, awesome. While Lisa's um, getting those slides up, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our organization. Um, so first, my name is Mariah Bosquez. I am the Director of Land Use and Creative Placemaking at Urban Neighborhood Initiatives, or UNI, because Urban Neighborhood Initiatives is a lot to say. Um, so UNI is a community development organization in the Springwells neighborhood of Southwest Detroit. Um, and our, our neighborhood is about, about 1.3 or so square miles in size. Uh, and it's very densely populated. And we have a ton of, of very young residents. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about our, our youth aspect of our work in just a bit. But uh, I also wanted to bring up that we're actually celebrating our 25th year in the org in the in the community. Um, I think today is our actual anniversary. Um, I think this is like our actual like starting date. Um, so 25 years today. Uh, and we work in a couple of areas of work. So specifically education, youth leadership youth workforce development, and land use and creative placemaking, um, which is what we're here to talk to you about today. And so with that, I'm actually going to pass it over to Lisa. Hello, good afternoon. My name is uh, Lisa Marie Rodriguez, and I'm going to introduce you to um, Southwest Detroit. So um, when we talk about conservation, we all have the same desires. It doesn't matter what community that we're in or what part of the country. Those desires are the same. Clean air, clean water. We'd like to see a bounty of uh, trees, canopy. We want to see um, some spaces just dedicated to habitat. And we're looking at um, today and in the future for um, great you know, solutions for stormwater mitigation. Now, depending on the community and the area that we're in, uh, those desires could lead into different types of um, initiatives. But basically, that's, that's kind of like um, an overall um, safe framework when we, when we talk about conservation or when that topic comes up. So I'm here to talk about conservation in an urban setting. Right now, I'm showing you a picture of either the sunset or sunrise, this beautiful skyscape, uh, trees, and we see birds coming in. And this is what we imagine, right, when we, when we talk about conservation. But in our neighborhood in Southwest Detroit, which is known as the Springwells area, our horizon looks a lot different than most communities. Now, our horizon, um, when we look, when we look, we're um, surrounded by industry, and as we all know, industry supplies a lot of pollution, um, and that pollution is something that we have to not only live with, but find ways to mitigate it. Right, find ways, find solutions to um, burden, to less burden um, our community with. But also, so we're talking about the horizon. We want to talk about what's actually on the land that we have to deal with as an obstacle. And those are the rail lines. And those rail lines circulate not only Southwest Detroit, but we can see the grid here that that comes in and out of our community. And these tracks have been laid here many decades. So we have, um, we have air pollution. We're talking about ground level pollution, um, obstacles that we're dealing with. And we also talk about rail lines. We talk about pollutants, right? But we're also talking about noise, right? this factor of this, these machines moving throughout the day. So we have these obstacles in our community and these obstacles outline the framework 
um, of, of our neighborhood. So part of the urban conservation is unique to um, cities is vacant lots. And a lot, and some of these vacant lots are, are really big in sizes. So this particular lot um, is over three acres. And this is interesting because it goes into, um, it goes into like this triangle. And here we're at the center of the triangle. And if we look into the picture to the far right, that's a viaduct back there. And the viaduct is where the, the train is gonna cross over and go on to its path. And to the left here is a residential street. So we have residents, we have a vacant lot, and we have the rail line that we're all dealing with this. Um, so th this, is, this is troublesome, right? Because the Southwest Detroit community, it's a walkable community. People walk everywhere. And so they're walking past us on a daily basis. What's interesting about this parcel is that it's right across the street from a school. So we can see the tree line to the left that we just looked at and we see the school. So we know there's a lot of activity. There's walking activity, there's driving activity. There's a lot of uh, community um, activity around the school. And that lot has been that same way for, for decades. So we now know that that lot is normalized, that people have accepted that lot being the way it is. But what happened? We just saw a lot, right? Three acres that were overgrown, dangerous. We saw that it was across the, uh, across the street from a school. And now the lot is clean. The lot has been transformed. What happened between those stages of decades of just overgrown to now this? Same way with this entrance in leading into our community, our, our Springwells neighborhood. And again, at, at the far end of this picture is a viaduct where, where a train's gonna pass, overgrown. Again, maybe three and a half acres wide, massive lot. What's across this? Why is this lot important besides being an entrance? It's also part of the business district. Across the street from this lot is a McDonald's. Who goes to McDonald's? Young people, parents, everyone, right? Goes to this, goes to this establishment and again, this large, this large lot has became normal. This is what's normal in our community. This is what's been accepted. What happened? What was this dynamic? What happened in the community to want to do this transformation? Overall, now we see that this space is now open, right? The entrance is now open. McDonald's looks a lot different. The walking area around this feels different, it feels safer. It feels like a neighborhood. Now we're looking below uh, the last two lots we saw, right? All this tremendous overgrowth. Now we're seeing something below ground, construction waste. We look at a lot and we look at this lot, looks fairly nice, right? Grass is cut flat. But what we see in the middle of that lot is a, is a large strip that is cement, concrete. We can see new curbs that were paved around this space. Those curbs are allowed to be there. As we started to create on this lot, we had to pull out all that waste, all that construction waste. Its transformation was the first stage of a bird habitat there. Something happened with those lots that we saw in this lot. Something happened within the community. And so um, Rob was there uh, just a few weeks um, and he was part of that kind of like phase two expansion. The, the first picture that we looked at with the bird habitat, that's to the left. Now we took on two additional lots to increase the habitat. And when Rob was there, we were tearing down a lot of the overgrown weeds. And then next, uh, next summer, spring, summer, we plan on putting more, more pollinators and trees into that space. So we talked about the, the what happened moment of how did community get, um, get involved and wanted to do something about this. And so what Uni did was uh, they, we started to think about stewardship and that word came out and it was like, well, what does that mean? We don't wanna enable, we don't wanna go and clean up an area and go back to it and kind of revisit it and try to get people back activated to it. But what, what we thought about and what we designed was that we would create a stewardship program where 
residents would come and nominate land that needed to be transformed. But how to get them engaged beyond that point? And so we started to think about residents need to be uh, communicated at um, at their time in their spaces. And, and so that's exactly what we did is that residents that would nominate a space, we met them at that space at their time. That meant like Wednesday night hot dogs, Sunday afternoon meetings. And then what we began to do, what I began to do is teach them what I do as an organizer. So I let them know that they were participating in a land stewardship program. The land wasn't owned by them, but they wanted to clean it up. And what did that look like? That meant that these residents would participate in community engagement. They would go around and knock on doors and let them know that cleanup was about to happen. They would be part of that cleanup day with volunteers. And they, that the real work, the real work of stewardship begins after the lot is clean. So once everything is done, once everything is beautified, they would now be in charge of that system of keeping it clean. And that means different levels, right? The physical level of actually removing brush or removing illegal dumping, or you could be eyes on that lot. When dumping happened, you could notify us, you could notify this group of uh, land, land stewardships, and we would activate that, that we would take away anything that was on that lot that shouldn't have been. And so they began to learn and they began to be in charge. And we're gonna see that some of the space is now owned by these land stewards. Oops, go back here. And so the, the stewardships, you know, they, they were just ordinary residents. We have Martin to the left here, um, who decided to take care of the, the four lots next to his own. Betty, who also helped with those same lots, began to help us with other lots. And we see that she just become creative and is using her truck as a ladder to get some, some of this brush here um, off the fence. And then Hugo, someone who works seven days a week, but would find time in the afternoon to come and help us um, remove invasive brush. What we have, when I say collective vision, what I'm, what I'm really saying is that our residents know and knew what they wanted to do with the land. They just needed support. If you ask them, they will let you know the history of the land, who's been dumping, and what, they, what they've always wanted to do, but they just needed the capacity to, to do it. Um, so when we talk about residents, we have to we have to talk about the youth. We have to talk about the young people, and uh, we are supportive uh, by the DNR. And we started this out years ago, where the DNR uh, did a pilot program for our organization. And, and at that time, it was called um, forestry, forestry, and um, young park rangers. And that's what they were doing: is they were helping me. Uh, with parks and green spaces. And then we evolved into vacant lots. So the DNR has been a great partner with us um, with youth employment and putting our young people to work in our green spaces. But they came with a lot of manpower, right? So my cohort was anywhere between 13 and 15 students. And we began to take over these lots, right? Those massive lots that we looked at the beginning. But you can imagine like 13 and 15 young bodies ready to take charge of their community. And we see a, a good uh, part of them removing this large tree, right? Together as a group. And we saw a lot of bonding happen. And when we were out in these green spaces, um, as we work with young people and we're there to guide them, we're also there as mentors. And as young people were activating and, and bringing solutions to their community, that's when they began to talk about themselves. That's when they began to open up. They were free outside. They were doing something. They, they felt good about it. And so they started to release anything that they, need, that they needed to, to myself and the other supervisors. So as we worked with our young folks, we began to work with other local schools um, around the area. And so now our cohort of 15 students began to grow. 30 students at a time, 50 students. And so we were able to really transform a lot of space and land uh, with the help of these um, young people. Part of the tutorial of young people uh, working on land is to know the land history. Like I said, um, 
Um, if you go to residents, they would tell you the history of the, of the land on their block. And so we have Ann Byrne, who is um, an, a consultant uh, for the land stewardship program. She has a lot of knowledge about plants and trees and landscape. And so she's teaching the young people about that construction waste we looked at the, at that first stage, but also what they're what they're looking at now as far as like pH level, what's what's be what was on this land, what needs to be on the land, and we see young people learning that from um, again a resident um, in in the community. Another partner of ours who really came in and taught us actually um, the next stage of uh, land stewardship was Detroit Audubon. Here we were looking at big, spark, uh, big spaces, big parcels to come in and just, you know, simply transform. And the Audubon was like, wait a minute, you know, this is great, but you really need to start looking up into the air. You really, not, you really need to look at stewarding um, air um, and stewarding who lives above you in the trees. And so we began to stop and like really think about what we could leave behind, or now thinking about the bird, and, and now designing a bird habitat. And that's where that started to evolve, was the relationship between the Detroit Audubon and our consultant, Ann Byrne, that led us to a bird habitat. And so the Audubon came in and started to talk to students about the bird treaty, about you know the, the rights of birds, what birds need, and that birds are our neighbors. They are, they are definitely our friends, but something that we need to keep in mind as we're designing or taking away from land or what that does to the habitat. And so the Audubon, um, the, the students were excited to meet them and they led some interesting programming. One of the programs that they led was um, building birdhouses. And so at this time, the students um, had to uh, design a birdhouse for a certain species. And these were some of the designs that came out of that, that, design, um, that design day. Um, and as we were installing the birdhouses um, on the habitat, this became a great moment for the residents living around the habitat to actually mentor the young people. And so we have our, our um, resident Jose here with one of our DNR students, Freddie. And so they began to talk and they began to bond and they began to install. And now they have this permanence of this, you know, this installation of a birdhouse that those two those two people um, gave this to um, gave that to the habitat. So that's a nice memory. Um, if Freddie knows that that's his birdhouse, you know that's that's what he's um, installed into that um, that space. So we have a vacant lot that was transformed. We have young people. We have residents that were part of that habitat habitat making. Now we wanted to activate it. So young people that began to do all the initial design work are now enjoying activation from that initiative and that became bird watching. Here we have Ashley who helped with all the sweat equity of the work. And now she's seeing this 360, right? Of what all this means now of inviting birds back into the neighborhood. And she's doing the observation of that. So we hosted uh, two bird watching um, events, uh, one led by the Detroit Audubon and the second led by a student who was really, um, just romanced about having and seeing birds and able to build a habitat for them. So we, we talked about, you know, these large scale efforts. Um, and we talked about like what the transformation meant from residents just accepting and now being part of um, a stewardship plan. And so we, we, we take this model of the land stewardship program, and we take it to different schools and areas that want us. And so the um, Cesar Chavez PTA, almost three weeks ago, invited me to come in and talk about um, water, stormwater mitigation, recycling, and also our land stewardship program. And they got excited, right? They saw residents get involved and take back their, their community, but also plant themselves into long-term solutions. And so, the PTA um, wanted to do something immediate to the school, Cesar Chavez on Martin Street in Southwest Detroit. And it was these five women that led that effort last Friday. And, and what did they do? Is that the two schools, the main school and the lunch hall 
connected through a walkway, almost like a, um, another parking lot. But the students are led from the main, the main building to the lunch area. And they were passing this fence in a, a really like all, really like awful alley that needed to be clean. And we could tell that this kind of like site has been there for years. But the PTA wanted to start first with around the school and then radiate out into the neighborhood. So they took it upon themselves that last Friday to get together and organize, um, organize themselves and some volunteers. And so here we can't, we really can't see the students crossing. We see the alley in an afternoon, right? The school is visible, the students feel safe, the PTA, and, I, and they, they were thanking me at the end. It's like, no, no, you, you did all this. We just showed you the model. And you you picked and you picked and choose what you needed to do, and that's what you did was that you first took care of the space that you belong to, which is that school, and so that's what it comes down to land stewardship, right? Is that no matter what community we in, we are in or what part of the, the the planet that we reside in, is that those spaces are sacred, whatever that may look like and wherever that may be, and this alley, right? It means something to people. And so that's what the overall mission of, of land stewardship in Southwest Detroit, what those solutions look like, how the residents like transform their land, but the underlining you know, message is that the space matters. And so uh, we welcome you. Um, and if you're ever in Southwest Detroit, we would love to give you a tour of our mission in action. Um, and show you our neighborhood really being taken care, trying to be taken care of by community volunteers and stakeholders. Um, this is my contact um, email. Um, it's been a pleasure and we welcome you really into our beautiful neighborhood. Thank you. Lisa, thank you. Just incredible work. Um, as Colleen says, incredible work. Thank you for sharing your organization's work and mission. Yeah, really, really spectacular. We are, we are, we are your fans from from nearby. And Danielle, we're gonna turn it over to you now. Beautiful, thank you. And thank you, Lisa, for controlling uh, the PowerPoint. Um, well, hello folks, my name is Danielle Dillard. Um, I'm the Land Use Program Coordinator here at Urban Neighborhood Initiatives. Um, and I'm gonna be speaking specifically to one of our programs that I coordinate, uh, which is the Southwest Food Cultivator Program. Um, so I, I think part of the reason I'm talking about this today is because it's a really good example of how we mix our, uh, our youth employment work with our land use. And so I actually sit at those two, um, I, within those two pathways at our organization. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about it and what we do. You can go next, Lisa. All right, so who are we? Please excuse this very blurry picture, um, but that's actually our team. Um, so we are, we're a youth employment program at UNI, um, and we pretty much work with folks 16 through 19 years old. Uh, although we, we do occasionally go outside of those, that's our main age range. Um, I typically have a cohort of about 12. Um, and like I said, we are, we're a youth employment program. And so we, we have a few different components, um, but we focus on um, work readiness, um, agriculture, culinary, lot transformation and design and community engagement. So um, yeah, that, that's essentially what we do when folks come into our program, they don't have to have a knowledge of gardening um, or you know cooking at all. They actually learn on the job. And so when they first come in, uh, we'll pretty much train them. A lot of the folks we work with haven't had a job yet. Some of them have, but for a lot of them, it's their first one. So we start with that work readiness piece, which is, um, you know, time management and communication, resumes, job searching, all of that. Uh, and then we actually get into, into the program um, where we'll, yeah, we, we essentially get into the program. So you can, you can press the next slide. Um, so sorry, the, I don't know what happened with the PowerPoint, why it looks like this, but these are a few pictures of um, what the lot actually looks like. So the way that this all got started, let me back up, is we, um, this program is fairly new. We're in our third year, y'all. We're going on to our third cohort, so that's very exciting. Um, neighbors had mentioned that they wanted a few things, um, and Lisa kind of touched at this, which is like one, safe spaces, right? Safe 
spaces, green spaces where they could be outside and places for the kids to be. Um, we also know that there was a big hunger for access to, to fresh food. And so we, um, we, we kept that in mind, right? And we also did listening with our youth in all of our programs and they pretty much shared that they wanted, uh, they wanted to learn about cooking. And so we thought, okay, we have these, these vacant lots, right? Um, that are often filled with, with dumping and um, other things that Lisa mentioned. So we have these vacant lots. We know that folks want safe spaces um, and our youth wanna learn about cooking and the neighbors want access to, to fresh food. So why not create a garden? And so in this lower picture here, um, you can kind of see where we began. We have, we now have a garden that's, let me fast forward. We have a garden called Viva La Garden. Um, and this is what the lot originally looked like when we, when we got started. Um, and going back even further, the, this is actually two lots that you're, you're seeing here. And it used to be two houses, um, that were abandoned houses. They were vacant. So eventually they were torn down. Um, and, and then you and I eventually got to work on them. Um, and so originally we had green team and unfortunately some of our, our things did get stolen. Uh, so we kind of had to start again. And, and my, my team actually ended up being the team that was chosen to work on this lot, which is really cool. So um, we decided that's where our, our garden would be. And it's right off of a really busy, busy street, which is Burner. Um, so we get a lot, a lot of traffic. Um, but yeah, that is, that, that's where the garden space is. And then you can kind of see our design process. So let me also say when we first got this lot, it was a big area for dumping. So a few folks were like, uh, I don't know if this is where you wanna have this garden. Um, and we were kind of determined to make it happen. Uh, naturally, we, we do soil testing and all of that to make sure that it is actually a safe space to grow food and we're good. Um, but yeah, so, that was kind of how it started. It was a little bit hilly, rocky, so we actually had to go in there with the youth, flatten the, the surface. Um, and then that picture up at the top is, um, those are four garden beds, and that is kind of how we made our start. So those were actually donated to us. Um, and unfortunately, the other pictures didn't load, but it kind of showed you the process of where we were at to where we are, um, to where we are now. And so, Elisa, you can, you can press the next slide. Let's see what shows up at those ones. Um, do or not? Nothing? Okay, that's okay. I'm prepared to talk about it. Um, but so so we had started with those four beds over there in the corner and then, and that was in our first cohort. And so we actually went through a whole engagement um, and design process with our young people. So they learn about how do we how do we design a vacant lot? What are the things that we we keep in mind? And um, before we do anything, we are, we go to the neighbors and make sure that they like what we're coming up with. So that that is really important to us. Um, one thing to note, though, most of our youth are also neighbors, which is pretty cool. So they they pass by this lot frequently, um, which is really important because it becomes a part of their daily life as well. And and they, some of them, we even have folks. If you see the apartment building right there. Some of our, our folks live in there. And so they literally see it every day and have seen the transformation over the years, which is cool. Um, but so we started with those five beds in the first cohort. And this past year, we were able to build four new beds, long beds. And they're, these ones are, they're raised beds, but they're, they're still somewhat in the ground. Um, we got a water harvesting system. We built a compost bin. Um, we have a little library coming up this, um, this Friday that will be put in. And it'll be a mix of, books um, around gardening, as well as um, seeds that we've harvested for neighbors. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, but so that that's a part of our process is that lot transformation, that community engagement, which we do with canvassing, community events. Um, we go out to different events too. Um, but then we actually have our, our actual Two of the main pathways that we have within this program um, are our agriculture, path, agriculture pathway and our culinary pathway. And so this is, it's an intro program. Um, we're not expecting everyone to go into those fields, but it's to introduce them to it should they eventually want a career in that. And so um, the agricultural piece is really focused around, around gardening, but we start with just kind of introducing them to all the different things you can do in career um, or in, in green spaces. Uh, and then we focus in on the garden. They learn about how to garden, you know, simple things to like how much 
sun a plant needs, water, fertilizer. Um, you know, we talk about the shading and then we go into different types of plants. We go through harvesting, then actually harvest um, the plants and the seeds. Uh, and the food that we grow is open to neighbors. It's, it's open to the whole community. So we're not gated in at all. People can come in whenever they want and take food, um, including the youth. And, and the youth work on it pretty much year round. Um, it is very cold in Detroit in the winter. So <laughs> we do put the garden to bed at that time, but for the most part, um, yeah, the youth work on it year round. Um, and so that that's more of the gardening piece, but then a big component for us too is that culinary piece. And so um, not only are we thinking about, you know, how are we, how are we growing food? How are we having fresh access to food while also meeting this beautifying of spaces, creating safe spaces, but also um, how are we, how are we then cooking with that food and making really yummy things? Um, so, you know, we go through the basics of orienting yourself in the kitchen, nice skills, pots and pans, and then we actually, um, we actually cook. And so we do cook food for neighbors as well. And, and we cook for ourselves too, um, just so that the young people can, can really gain an understanding of not only how to grow your own food, but then what you do with that food. Um, so we focus on things like herbs as medicine, food as medicine, uh, and yeah, it is, it's a really, it's a really cool program. Um, and I, I think a big component of it is this mixing of, of the land, um, land, community and, and food, and not only food as physical survival, but also cultural survival um, and, and celebration of community. So that is our program. We're actually starting our third cohort up, like I said, so we begin in either we're going to start either January, February of this next year. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really excited. So if you know folks who are interested in Southwest Detroit, um, we would love to work with them. Um, oh, an honorable mention of our wonderful partners that make some of this stuff happen. Um, Keep Growing Detroit, they're wonderful um, throughout the city of, of Detroit, and they really help us with a lot of our produce. And they actually gave us access to the, not these beds in the picture, but some of the other ones. Um, Eastern Market, we're able to cook in their kitchen at times. Um, Greening of Detroit is gonna be coming soon and we're gonna be planting trees all around that, ornamental trees to also bring folks in. Um, and then, you know, we even do cooking workshops with folks who, one of our one of our partners started in UNI programming when he was just a kid and then went through programming as he got older, now is a manager or as a, a member of the board of the bike shop and also does um, cooking workshops. So you can see that we're, we're really intentional about how we interact um, with neighbors and it, it's very much so like the whole way this community or excuse me this program started was with community input um, and we're continuing to do that throughout so yeah I'm, I'm really honored to be um, working in this program. Yeah I can see why Danielle it's so <laughs> awesome right yeah what a, what a tremendous transformation. Um, one of the questions that Gretchen asks is who owns the underlying properties? So part of so part of the the plan when we started was that, and part of the problem um, in our area is absentee ownership. So mm -hmm. we have we have owners that um, live outside the area, sometimes out of the country, that have owned parcels, and um, those parcels are not maintained. And so that's what started to um, it was kind of like uh, we were looking at foundational problems was that there was no representation of the land. So the land was being disarranged, such as those big parcels that we looked at. So what, what we did it, within the land stewardship program is try to reach out to those landowners um, and let them know that transformation was about to happen. But one of our steward, one of our stewards, and that was on the very opening line, very opening photograph of the um, email that went out for this webinar was Martin on his lot. His lot was four lots on Green and Lane decided to clean it, decided to transform it. Um, and as of this year, he now owns those lots. Wow. Now that wasn't something overnight, right? Because he right. actually didn't want anything to do with ownership. He just wanted to clean it. And Martin's first design was to, um, he was gonna fence it, fence it with an opaque fence, six foot fence and close it in and block off the neighborhood. It was like, Martin, you know, this is an important piece. You know, we, you know you're gonna miss seeing the, the neighborhood around the lot. And so we started to talk to our neighbors about soft borders, not the fence, but maybe rocks, maybe something to uh, let people know that the lot is owned, but still have it still be part of the community. Once you put up a six foot fence, 
right you block off everything so so no we our work was based on a lot of um land that wasn't owned but actually was it was deteriorating the community mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that makes sense um a couple different so danielle how do you choose how do you how does your cohort get chosen of students um so we that's a great question um we pretty much we we put out the flyers of it being time to bring people on, um, and then I'll I'll put my my email on there, which is also I believe in this article. I think there's contact information, um, and and yeah, they just contact me. I'll do a quick interview and see if they are right for the position, and and then we we let them in. We do typically work within, like I said, within Southwest, um, and and that's because we want to make sure things are really accessible. So a lot of our you, young people may not have access to transportation. And so, you know, you can ride your bike, you can walk. Um, so making sure that it's it's really close. But yeah, that's it. As soon as you see any of our flyers up, please reach out and have a conversation with me. Um, this is not our only land use program. We also have SWAMP, which is our, our arts and mural, Southwest um, Urban Arts and Mural Project. So they do a lot of our artwork around Southwest Detroit and, and here at our center too. They're also gonna have, I think we're gonna have 36 different paintings up in the the garden um, next year that is all done by youth. So we also have like that internal collaboration. We also have Southwest Rides, um, which is if you're interested in, in uh, or no young people are interested in learning how to um, how to fix a bike or and, and do some of that business piece that Southwest Rides. And then finally, um, Green Team is our fourth one, which is more of our landscaping um, program. So all of those are available. Um, so yeah, if, if it's not just Southwest Foods, please reach out for the other ones too. That's great. A um, couple other questions. One of the one of the um, things that I always think about with these is how can we get resources to these kind of awesome programs? So can you talk a little bit about how what funding is like for these and and how how they get funded and how you might like additional funds and whatever else that might be? So our goal, our goal for land stewardship is to look at um, like a a, um, a conservatory, a conservatory plan among pocket parks, which we have, which we're known for our community is pocket parks in the area, which is good because the metric is like every like five to eight blocks, there's a small green space or, or a small park that, that people can go and heal themselves. And so those type of, if it's not a grand park, those type of grants um, don't come our way. Um, those are for larger parcels or city parcels that could be part of a, like a larger uh, larger conservation plan, conservatory plan. We would like to look at a ten year plan that could fund um, that could fund these type of initiative, which is unique, right? Vacant lots, green spaces, pocket parks, where it can employ residents and young people. Uh, one of the like one of the land banks in this uh, initiatives in like Genesee County is that their land bank actually, um, or did in the past, hire residents to take care of and maintain spaces. That would be an ideal plan for us is to build um, a conservatory around these spaces and employ our residents and young people. And of course, we know anyone working with on land is that tools are one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest ass um, assets and the maintenance and repairs of those tools. Um, and then, you know, sometimes it's just human error, right? You get volunteer group and they might break some tools and you got to repair them. So it's all this cycle, but we would love to talk to anyone out there um, looking at um, a 10 year plan to secure these spaces and to secure future spaces. Um, right now, the city of Detroit has somewhere close to 100,000 vacant lots. We don't have that many in South, in Springwells, but, we, but they keep increasing. So we would love to talk to someone out there about a partnership have them come into our neighborhood, see the work, and see the expansion that we would like to do. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Danielle, another question. What are the favorite things to cook together in the youth program? Um, I love that. So I will say every year it changes because we have a different cohort, different people. Um, typically, some of our folks will stay and some of them will leave. But right now, I think some of the, the ones that we've liked the most, um, pasta from scratch has been really fun. Yeah, yeah. Eastern Market actually came in and, and led that workshop and they loved it. They loved it. Um, we recently made um, pan de muerto for, for Dia de los Muertos. 
um, mm -hmm. which is, it's a, it's a, like a sweet bread of sorts. And so that was really fun. None of us had made it. And so we just, we just tried it and it came out beautifully. And then we put it on the, um, on the ofrenda, on the, the altar space. Um, so, so that was really nice. I know those two are big, um, trying to think of some other ones, desserts. They love the desserts portion. Um, and so we, some of the youth that have come through love baking. Um, and so we've had cupcakes, we've done, um, pumpkin pies. So it really, yeah, lots of, lots of different things. We also, every year we do, or so far, you know, we're st going on to our third, so we're still fairly new, but we do, um, grilling which is really fun and so um that's actually one of the partners i was talking about who started in programming when he was just a kid he's the one who comes and he does grilling with us like grilling 101 and talks about the history of grilling so yeah i could i could pretty much go on and on but having said that we are always loving to to partner with people who feel really passionate about a food that they make and so if that's you um and you find yourself in the neighborhood we would love to to chat because uh, they're always wanting to learn new things. That's great. And then speaking of the neighborhood, um, another question asks, um, have you partnered with other communities outside of Southwest Detroit about this work and um, how similar or different it is in other urban environmental spaces? Yeah, we, we um, for the stewardship program, we, we bounce around to PTA meetings, community group meetings. And, and so, so just like last, Friday, last Friday's group, um, how I started that PTA meeting was that um, there was three sheets of paper on the door. It was um, nominated space. What's, what's, what do you see in that space? What type of dumping? And the third piece of paper kind of rocked everyone at that moment because it was, it was the triangle change. It's like, what are you going to do about it? And so they were, they were startled. They, they moved back. And they're like, whoa, whoa, I'm like, no, 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 we have to do this work. So what are you gonna do about it? And so when we show the model to different communities, one of the things that I stress uh, to the audience is that we need to rely less on the city. Mm -hmm. We need to do this work ourselves. And I said, when we do call the city, they know what type of action that, they, that we have planned. I call my district six manager, um, she knows to come with the pickup. She knows that we're organized. We're going to have things ready for her and that we're trying to do this ourselves and that we lean on the city for those big things that we can't do. But as far as like our maintenance of our community, I, I stress to people that's our responsibility. So mm -hmm. yes, we've taken it. Um, and there's been some epiphanies, right? When someone comes into your neighborhood and says, well, you need to take care of it. Um, it's a way to bring up that mirror and do some self-examination uh, of why we didn't do it. Mm -hmm. But once they do get once they get organized and once they actually sit down and talk to each other, the neighbors, they realize someone has this equipment or someone knows someone. And so they begin to actually rebuild their own community among themselves. So it's fascinating. Yeah. And Lisa, just how you just started out in the very beginning, that, that that's what we find with all of this stewardship work, right? I mean, it's so transformational, not only for the land, but for the relationships among the community and among the people and the relationship with the land, whether that's, whether that's a natural area somewhere out or whether that's an urban neighborhood. And you start to, you start to realize that connection. Yeah, I've, I've written some, some, pa some papers on this. And one of the biggest papers was that the green space it's actually a relative. Yes. It could be like a distant cousin, but we have a relationship with these spaces, mainly because they have archived moments in our lives for celebration, we're growing up, we might be we might meet someone, our young people have grown up in these spaces, but they're an integral piece of our lives. Mm -hmm. And no matter where we're at in the country, what that space looks like, we're connected to that land. Yeah. Yeah. It's so powerful. So we have people speaking of all over the country, you know, we have people tuning in from Seattle or from Iowa or from Michigan as well. Are you connecting with other programs uh, across the country? One of the, we were involved in a um, community wellness project in, in Washington, DC, and it connected several, it connected elders. First of all, we had a council of elders looking over the bounty of work. But we connected with three cities at that time. It was uh, the Delta and it was also Louisiana. 
and and we all came to this grant to this to Washington for different reasons. Um, but what it came down to among these cities and communities is that um, how do we build authentic relationships? What do those relationships look like, right? And how I came aboard to UNI was to understand relationships between um, residents and local parks because parks were going in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And out of those conversations came, no one really spoke to us <laughs> or like they gifted us somewhat, gifted us this, this space, right? But we didn't know how to enact because you, you, you were doing all this wonderful work. We didn't know how to put ourselves in, the, in that space. And that's what I found out, find out about like transformations at that scale was that people were removed, right? They were removed out of that equation of like what to do next. They were waiting for some help to come. And so when I go and talk to communities like don't rely on the city, they look at me like I'm crazy. It's like, no, no, the, we, have, we, have all, we have everything we need. We just need to get organized. Exactly. That's that's very much you 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 know the work at the stewardship network. That whole thing is the authentic relationships are what it's about, and then understanding as we get to know each other, understanding both what we what we have to offer and what we need. And once you know that, Danielle, as you were saying, you know, and then people in the neighborhood, it's all of a sudden, it's like, okay, we can bring this here. You know, a couple questions as we a couple as we kind of wind down our final minutes here, and it's just been so such a pleasure to learn about the work and to Lisa, to be with you, Danielle and Mariah, to meet you both for the first time. Um, when you think about the biggest challenges in your programs, what are those? You know, I, 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 I would say so much of a challenge is that, um, I guess it's, I, so, I, so I, when, I, when I talk to people, I, I put the head on a being teacher. Mm -hmm. And I think good teachers become students at the same time. Right. So as I'm teaching, I'm also learning. Um, and I'm learning to be humble of how people have lived with something. Why would someone wanna live down the street from that vacant, from, with that vacant lot for 20 years? I can't go in there and like, wow, you know, like, the, you know, but to be humble that they lived and accepted that and that for whatever reason, they, they raised their children, they raised their grandchildren, that that was just a lot that they just walked past. But just that mindset, right, of like, um, th this is normal. Right. So I think that, I think the, like, the challenge with just accepting that people have accepted um, uh, urban space like this. But once they once once those trans once those transformations happen, you know the area surrounding it began to change. Um, but also, so for me, it's just having um, having the community look that way for a certain amount of time mm -hmm. was more disappointing than a challenge. Yeah. Yep. And Danielle, anything? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think for myself, I work with so I. I as, as you ask that question, I'm, I'm kind of piecing it together in my head. I feel like I, I work with people and I work with the land. Mm -hmm. um, and something that is true about both of those things is change. <laughs> and so I think um, doing the work that, cause I, I'm, I'm working with the land. I'm also working in, in, with a youth program. A lot of that is youth development. And so um, we kind of, I, I just have to be like water right? Like water is, is yeah. um, like strong and fierce, but also know when to kind of do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like that's, that's the work. And it's really cool how it shows up in the work too, because maybe one day we plan to go do soil testing, or we plan to move around a whole bunch of dirt, and all of a sudden it's pouring rain. Um, and that plan that we all had, it, we can no longer, we can't do anymore, right? Um, but what a good life lesson <laughs> that things are bigger than, um, than our control. So I think that's probably the most challenging thing and that shows up obviously in all of our lives as well um but also a, a really good learning aspect too that's a great way to describe it yeah well i want to thank you too and offer you any chance for any final comments that you have before we kind of wind down and let people get to their next top of the hour thing and thank you both so much in the entire uni team for all that you do like i said we're, we're fans we're close by fans of yours I, I just want to thank anyone that has volunteered 
that has volunteered outside their community, that has donated or supported green space work. We thank you. Um, anyone that's protested for Audubon or um, have, has done or spoke out about um, you know, the value and protection of land, I just wanna just say thank you. Yes, I will, I will echo that, that thanks and appreciation. And thanks to you all online for joining us for the Stewardship Network's monthly webcast. Always wonderful to be here um, with you. And uh, Stephanie asks Danielle if you can drop your email in the chat for contact, but she's got somebody. I wanna remind you all um, online that uh, we're gonna be virtual again. Stewardship Networks Conference, February 2nd and 3rd. It is $60 per person for both days. So a steal at that price, but wait, if you register by 1118, it's only $40. So I encourage you all to get online. As we've said, we've had a great response. Um, looking forward to bringing you together uh, next month on December 14th, the second Wednesday during the Eastern Time Zone's noon hour, Pacific Coast 9 a.m. hour, um, 9 a.m. hour. And next month we'll be talking with Bill who owns Wild Type uh, nursery about the economic and availability of native plant production. And so Danielle, I'll drop in there Bob's Bob's chat that I think you saw about native trees. And so Bill could be a great source for those. So again, thank you all online. Great to have you part of the Stewardship Network's monthly webcast. Good to be with you. Take care. And we'll see you again next month. Thank you.